Yeah, so can you just double, I will tell you what we think, but you said there's been a frustration with the offense. Can you just kind of elaborate on like what your frustrations are and what you're seeing? Because I, it sounds like you watch a ton of football, watch a ton of <laughs> offense, and I think and people sleep on that. People think, oh, like you know, like he didn't play or whatever. He's not a coach, but just watching a lot of ball gives you a, a beautiful perspective on what's good offense and what offense is kind of lacking in certain areas. And especially once you get outside of one team's bubble, we get so hyper focused. And you know, that's why like teams or fans will look comment all the time on our stuff. Like it's the worst offensive line in the league. And every metrics metric says they're average. Like they're not good, but they're not the worst in the league. And it's like, cause we get caught in our own bubble. We see a bunch of sacks and it's like this, how can it possibly be worse? And it's like, well, <laughs> let oh, me man. tell you. <laughs> Let's talk about that. So, so watch, yeah. What do watch you some s- Carolina Panthers if you, if you <laughs> want to see. Worse. God, yeah. If you want to see the worst of anything, watch the Carolina Panthers. Um, <laughs> anyway, they won last weekend. Good for them. What do you yeah. see for, what do you see from this offense? Yeah. Good for them. Not so great for the Atlanta Falcons. That was a tough, <laughs> tough situation there. Yeah. No, I think the, my, my problem with this offense is I think they put, like I said, a, they put a lot on Sam Howell's plate. And this is a guy that is a, his first year starting. Uh, it's the second year in the league. He doesn't have a ton of experience on his belt. But I, I think they don't really give him a lot of, like, layup plays. Um, I think they, again, they want to push the ball down the field. They want to pass the ball a lot. Like, one thing I, I noticed, and, and again, this is talking with our quarterback guy, Derek Klassen, like, and he posted some good clips of this. Like, in the Cowboys game, and obviously that game went, went to hell uh, later on in the process, but, like, Dallas is just lining up like Micah Parsons at the nose tackle spot, like on first and 10. And it's like, they, this team doesn't believe you're going to run the ball or like establish a running game at all They They know you're going to drop back a ton. And this is an offense is really high in terms of like pass rate over expectation. If you want to look at those metrics. And I, I think that just puts a lot on a quarterback. It puts a lot on an offensive line that maybe it's not the worst in the league, but I still wouldn't say it's like an above average protection unit. So you know, we're getting we're getting Sam, Sam Howell hit a lot. I don't think he's been great in terms of like second reaction plays. So um, I would like to see them get like, again, put some more of those layups in place, right? Like have Sam Howell just focus in on one read because that's another thing that's been crazy about this offense is like they throw to a ton of guys. Like you look at some offenses and, and they have really quality players. They funnel to like three guys. I mean, San Francisco is obviously an easy example to come back to because they have like four superstar level players in Ayuk, Samuel, McCaffrey, and Kittle. I do think Washington has a great receiver trio in McLaurin, Dotson, uh, and Samuel, but like they involve a ton of players. And I think when you're asking Sam Howell to read out so many plays like that, again, it puts a lot of stress on the quarterback. Like when I, again, when I watch this offense, I feel like there's not a ton of easy buttons and the quarterback is under a ton of uh, a ton of stress, whether it's from a protection standpoint, whether it's from uh, a route standpoint. I just think they've put a lot on his plate. And Real quick. So easy buttons. We've talked a lot about easy buttons. Do you have plays that you're like, oh, like because, again, you watch so much offense that you're like, oh, this is an easy button in San Fran. This is an easy button in Kansas City. This is an easy button in Philadelphia. Do you have those plays? And, and like, can you just give an example for our listeners potentially? Great example. Uh, I think the the best in terms of route combinations and route concepts to open guys up right now is probably in Detroit. Um, they mm. have so many layups for Amon Ross St. Brown. And like you have to have the right players to do this. And I don't necessarily know that um, any of these guys profile as like that power slot player because they don't mm. have a ton of size. There's a lot of smaller players in this receiver room. Uh, you, like Terry's the biggest. And like you said, he's not necessarily um, a big wide out, but he does have to win those like press coverage, big boy routes on the outside. I, I love the way in Detroit, like again, they'll clear everything out, whether you're running like deep corner routes, whether you're just running go routes uh, from the slot. And then the nearest inside slot receiver is St. Brown and he can just run a simple slant, a crossing route. Um, I think another example is in Houston. This player's hurt now, but Tank Dell, even when he wasn't getting the ball, they would have him run, you know, these big, deep outbreaking routes. And actually, it's crazy because he's a rookie receiver. But to me, he was probably the best receiver on like outbreaking routes this year. But then you'd have Nico Collins come inside as that X receiver uh, running like big dig routes and deep in routes, post routes. And those two guys would work in concert together to, to get one or the other open. And they have a high level quarterback who can read it out. I don't think Washington necessarily like all of these routes necessarily work together. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's been an issue for the quarterback to, to try to constantly be under duress. 
I think that's fantastic insight, by the way. I think that's a good, that's a really good succinct way of putting it. And I think you see, you know, just like in the in the Houston Texans example, like p- speak to your player's skill sets, right? Nico Collins is a bigger guy. Let him work the middle of the field. You can see that better through the traffic. Tank Dell is a very petite guy, but hyper twitched yeah. up. His route running nuance is off the charts. Like <clears throat> watching him run routes is is spectacular. So let him speak to that outbreaking outcut stuff, the comeback stuff, where body weight is going to be kind of like to your advantage, like that lighter body weight, it can really decelerate and come out. So I think that's a, that's a great point. And then just finding easy throws in the context of what they do. Well, I love the example of Amon Ross St. Brown as well. Like they, they do such a good job getting him into bunches, getting him in the slot and being like, we're going to clear this space out. You're great in space. You're going to win this one-on-one and Jared Goff doesn't have to read. Like he's not reading drive. He's not reading scissors to the flat. It's just like, this is it. If it's not there, I can check the ball down to someplace else. It was funny when uh, St. Brown was coming into the draft, I called him Bud like Cooper Cup, like at USC, <laughs> which is funny, which is funny because he's like playing as an outside receiver, but you watch him right. even just play as an outside guy and you're like this is a player who should be kind of that big slot receiver like Cooper Cup. And then he ends up getting drafted by Detroit. Then Detroit's obviously got Jared Goff. And like I, like we were talking about earlier, some receivers just work so well with certain quarterbacks. Like a hey, this guy, like I don't have to read this thing out. I know this guy's gonna be open and I can just funnel him the ball in the middle of the field. That is perfect for a Jared Goff type of quarterback. So if we take this uh, to like the long-term view for Washington, if you could add something to their receiver room and you know, you've got Dotson, you know, you've got McLaren, Samuel's a free agent. Like what would you, what would you be looking to do to, to make, to kind of optimize this receiver room personnel wise and schematically? I think uh, Logan, you brought the point of about like Nico Collins and how you can see that guy over the field, like a big X receiver to run these in breaking routes. I think that would really help out this receiver room because you can get then Terry McLaurin away from that X receiver spot. And it's not, again, it's not as if I have really any issue that McLaurin can go out on the line of scrimmage as ISO receiver and beat press man coverage. But I think you could, especially as he ages, you know, I mean, he's going to, he, he's weirdly like an older, or he was an older rookie coming into the NFL, sure. right? Can we like, just double click I, I, your points on point, but I just want to make sure the listeners understand. So when you're the X, you're on the ball. So you have to deal with these press situations a little bit more. When you're the Z, you are, you're off the ball and we can motion you around the formation a little bit better, which again, I think would just watching Terry would speak to his skill set a little bit more. So if you get a big Haas out there playing X, think like Julio Jones, Calvin Mike Johnson, Evans right? is the guy that's Mike Evans. Out because he's a free agent. Right. hundred percent. Like those guys, they're big physical dudes. You can see them over the middle of the field and they can like kind of bully corners. Let's get Terry off and let him move around a little bit. But I just want to make sure our listeners understood kind of what you were saying there with the X and the Z stuff. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think a good example of this, cause I mean, you're, you're right to say like, it's good to kind of have these other examples around the league, right? Cause I think it helps you kind of contextualize it. Like what the Bills have done with Steph Diggs, who's another – I mean, I think he's one of the best route runners in the NFL. He's been one 100%. of the best route runners in the NFL since um, – I mean, he was a big reception perception hit. That was like back in Minnesota. <laughs> it's like this this guy, trust me, like is number one, number two, number three in success rate versus man press every single year. Like he could be an elite production player if he's just in the right situation. Obviously with a great quarterback in Buffalo, that's happened. But you also see them do a lot to like get – him off the line of scrimmage and get him free releases because then yeah his route running and his timing and technique can really be uh sh- can be expressed and, and can shine in that way i think terry could certainly do that um and, and even like gabe davis is a, a very inconsistent player but the bills are content to even if he's going to quote lose these routes out at the x receiver position if he can deal with those press corners and allow Diggs to be off the line it it helps your number one. Like you can have these guys who you maybe you, I don't know if they need to get like a Mike Evans or something like that, because I think Terry and John Dotson are perfectly capable of being like a one and a two on a team. But if you can just get a guy out there to handle some of those X receiver reps and, and maybe eventually develop into a, a high level starter, like I think that's going to go a long way for this group. Interesting. And then is there anything from us? Like, Obviously, they're going to be looking for a new staff, um, specifically head coach. We all assume the enemy is probably not going to be around next year as well. Um, you mentioned Detroit. You mentioned some of the other, you know, Bobby Slowick in Houston. You like some of the stuff that they're doing. Given Terry and Jahan's skill sets, is there anything schematically where you'd be like, that'd be my guy for Washington? 
yeah, I think those are two guys to, to bring up if you're looking for an offensive play calling head coach. Um, uh, ben Johnson obviously would be a home run. I think a lot, I think he's going to get paid a lot of money. I mean, anybody yeah. that's uh, <laughs> I think Josh I don't know Harris how is going to pay a lot of money. That's actually exciting for once here. Right. That that is good. You're going to need to outbid David Tepper. Uh, you know, but he did he did turn down that job last year. He's, so yeah, Te- Tepper's going to have to pay a Tepper tax. So I'm not concerned yeah. as much about that one. I'm much more concerned about hey, you could go coach Justin Herbert. Yeah. I, I do think it's it's exciting though if you're an offensive head coach like 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 a Ben Johnson, right? Cuz I wouldn't say this group is a is a total blank slate, right? Because you have uh, good players here. Even in the backfield like I I like what Brian Robinson brings to the table, you know, as a, as a power back. I think that was kind of underutilized at times this year. And I I think if you like let's say right now they're I think they're slated to pick 4th in the draft, right? Mm-hmm. Um you you look at that and you say okay we, maybe we get a quarterback at four whatever or we bring back Sam next year and like have him compete with somebody like I I think Sam Howell actually would be much better in an offense like that that's gonna simplify things like throw to your first read more often don't spread the field a ton with these like four receiver sets you know get multiple tight ends in there right because I think um I I think Jahan Dotson can play slot I think he could play flanker like best utilized there and then you know obviously Terry maybe he plays X and two receiver sets but then moves off the ball to the flanker spot with this other hypothetical big X receiver we've brought in here maybe in the draft whatever like I think something like that where you're condensing the field more is is the best approach here especially if you have to run it back with Howell yeah makes sense to me uh Logan any anything else that you wanted to to follow up on touch on no, I love it. I mean, I love the I love the insight. And I guess I don't know how do you you dra- I mean, I'm sure you do college guys as well. Have you done anything with Marvin Mar- Marvin Harrison Jr.? I know there's some talk about him being there at 4. Just high level thoughts on him as a player and is he as good as everyone says? Yeah, I haven't gotten to prospects yet. Um, yeah. it sounds it sound- like you're very busy. If you're doing eight <laughs> games on a guy, it sounds like you're very busy. So, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, look- no problem there. <laughs> I'm I'm excited uh, uh, that the draft is supposed to be filled with a ton of good receivers. At the same t- time, though, I'm like, yeah, damn, your boys, your boys gonna be busy. Uh, there's <laughs> yeah, also Miller, like Matt. We had Matt Miller last week, and he said he might, he has eight receivers currently in the first round. Oh yeah, it's gonna it's gonna, it's gonna be, be a long. You're like, yeah, it's gonna be a long spring. <laughs> no, <laughs> Not to mention help. too the. Uh, look, obviously, free agency. Uh, the first group that I usually put on on the site in the off season is the upcoming free agents. So, mm-hmm. um, even if the guys end up getting tagged, which this certainly could be, that's a pretty good looking group too. You've got T. Higgins, you've got Mike Evans, you've got Michael Pittman. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, there's a lot of, and by the way, a couple of guys that could fit. I don't know if you need to spend that kind of money on a free agent X receiver, but like Higgins and Evans, these guys are are going to be in that group too. Of what we're kind of looking for here for Washington. But yeah, that is interesting. Marvin Harrison at, at fourth overall, if he happens to get there, because whatever we're talking about, like, yeah, you could you could have a developmental X receiver to mostly just take pressure off the other guys and stuff like that. You have a prospect like that in there. That would be pretty hard to, to pass up because he is supposed to be that prototypical number one X out there. Yeah, he's he's a potential Hall of Famer is, is the way that he's coming out, which is scary to put on a kid. But well, yeah, a lot of, uh, maybe it's no a little easier when his dad already did it. Uh all right, so the Reception Perception podcast uh, is out uh, on all your favorite podcast platforms, including the free Odyssey app. And then uh, receptionperception.com and the website, Matt? Yes, sir. Yeah, we got three tiers of subscri- subscriptions, uh, something for everybody. If you want, like, the we literally call our highest tier package the Sicko uh, tier because <laughs> if you want every piece of Reception Perception data I've charted since 2014, you get it with that package, and that verifiably makes you a Sicko if you want that. But <laughs> I, appre- I appreciate the Sickos who, who do indeed uh, purchase and want that. Logan's package. like, where do I, I sign? It sounds awesome. It sounds awesome, and especially if you're watching that much film to support the numbers because like it's and especially if you're doing it yourself you know i think that's one of the big criticisms of, of some other products out there is that you know you get some people who aren't as well versed in the metrics grading games so that sounds yeah. like a i mean I, I i don't know how much it costs but i'm definitely interested i'll tell you that <laughs> well i appreciate it yeah no um i love doing this it's 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 the reason I got into doing this. And obviously I do a lot more stuff uh, now from, from a media standpoint, but uh, you know, James, who's my co-host at reception perception and my business partner on the site, you know, he's always talking about like, maybe we can get, you know, some other people in here doing the charting work. I'm like, nah, you gotta, you gotta pry that like out of my cold <laughs> dead hands. Cause that's the, that's the part, that's the part that I like. And, and I agree with you, Logan, like you can tell, I mean, Wash is a great example. It's like people, it's like, why, why aren't these receivers producing when Sam Howell's putting up all these numbers? It's like, well, 
there's a lot to it beyond just the stats sure. and everything. And that doesn't mean that Sam Howell stinks or like he's holding all these guys back, but there's a lot of context that goes into the situation and being the one to go in and, and, and do the film work is uh, you can tell when people don't do it. And, and look, I, I mean, I, I like doing it and uh, thank God. Cause it is uh, it is, it's going to be a busy off season as we say. <laughs> for sure. Uh, we'll definitely have to have you back to, to talk about it, especially if the commanders go, whether it's free agency draft, start signing guys, et cetera. Uh, Matt Harmon reception perception. Thank you, sir. This was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for job. sure. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching this clip of take command. First, why don't you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067, the fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart. <laughs>